Hello. Hi. Welcome. We are Garden Church. Hey, we're glad you're here. Hey guys. We, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. We, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. Welcome to Garden Church. We're glad you're here. Yeah. We're glad you're here. We are Garden Church. We are the Garden Church. Welcome to the Garden. We are Garden Church. Hello. Welcome. We are, we are Garden, Garden Church. Church. We're glad you're here. Hi. We're happy to see you. We, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. Hey there. Welcome. We are Garden Church. Hello. We are glad you are here. We are Garden Church. We are Garden Church. We are Garden Church. Hey everybody, we are Garden Church and we're so happy you could be here with us today. Hi. Say hi. Hi. So glad you're here. Hi. Welcome. We are Garden Church. Hi, we, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. We, we are Garden Church. Church. We are Garden Church. Yeah. We are Garden Church. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. We, we are Garden, Garden Church. Church. Hey there. We're glad you're here. We, we are Garden Church. Church. We, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. We, we are Garden Church. Hi there. We're glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. Hey there. We are the Garden Church. We are Garden Church. Hey everybody, welcome. We're glad you're here. We are Garden Church. We, we are, are Garden, Garden Church. Church. We are Garden Church. <laughs> hey there. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're, we're here. Glad you're here. Hey, hey we're Garden Church. Welcome. We're family. <laughs> we're glad you're here. Hi, we are so glad you're here. We are Garden Church. Good morning, Garden Church. It's Pastor Michael here, and I'm so glad you're joining us this morning to worship together and gather around our Sunday service. If this is your first time with us, or if you've been around for just a little while and you haven't yet connected, we wanna to get to know you. So you can get your phone out and text the word connect to the number below, or you can head to our website, click the link that says, are you new? And we would love to connect with you. And I want to encourage you, if you want to experience the life of our community and our church family, and where discipleship is happening, you have to do it with others. To be a gardener right now is to be part of our groups, whether you want to join or lead one. We talked about this a few weeks ago, we heard from Pastor John, but what it means to be community is to walk together, to grow in our discipleship to Jesus with others. We need each other to do that. And these groups meet online throughout the week, so you can sign up on our app or our website to be a part of one. We have a lot of exciting things happening in our community right now. The first is, and we announced this last week, but next weekend we're going to be having live outdoor worship gatherings at two different locations on Sunday, February 28th. We'll have a 9 and an 11 a.m. service at Long Beach Christian Fellowship and a 5 p.m. service in Orange County, Costa Mesa, at Lighthouse Church. We are completely at capacity now, so we've added a 1 p.m. gathering at Long Beach Christian Fellowship. If you want to reserve tickets for that gathering, you can go to our website or app right now and register for you, your family, or your roommates. For those of you who aren't able to come, we want you to know we'll have our normal online services that weekend as well, and hopefully more outdoor gatherings soon. This last Wednesday, it began a season, the season of Lent. It's this time the church celebrates. That's a time of preparation, gets us ready for the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday. We want to invite you to join us as a community as we fast from some things and take on some formative practices during this season. So what is this fast? It's a fast from social media, alcohol, and anything that brings distraction into your life. Ask yourself this question, what brings about spiritual death? And what would it look like to give that up for Lent? We also want to invite you to choose a time to pray every day until Good Friday. Pray at the same time and create a rhythm of prayer for yourself. It can be a minute or just 10 minutes, but have a space of intimacy with Jesus. And lastly, we want to invite you into a season of simplicity to give one thing away every day for Lent. And that can look creatively. Ask God, what would that look like for me to be generous each day in a new way? You can go on our website, our app, to get even more information on how to join the fast. And as a way of modeling this, we as a church are taking our Instagram offline for the season of Lent. 
During this time off of social media, we would still want to stay connected with you in the most helpful ways possible, and we'll mainly be communicating through email, our app, and our Sunday service. So we have a short survey. It just takes about a minute to fill out, which is going to help us develop and get resources for your discipleship into your hands. Practically, we know that everyone's in a different season and stage of life, and so we want to learn a little bit more about you in order to get the things in front of you that are best and most helpful. So you can use the QR code on the screen or head to our website and app to fill out the survey if you haven't yet. And we've been talking a lot about the Long Beach Community Table and how in the last few months they're working to feed the hungry in our city. And now we get to show you what that looks like. So check out this video. Community Table is a collaborative of concerned citizens in the city of Long Beach and we all coming together as one unit to provide food security for our most vulnerable residents in the city. And uh, we've been doing this with Long Beach Community Table since March, no, my, uh, April of 2020 and it, it's just a perfect match in heaven. Yeah. You know, because the main goal is to get people fed, yeah. stop these, inf these food insecurities that's going on yeah. in the city. Uh, we are in desperate need for more volunteers because as long as this pandemic is going on, food insecurity is going to increase within the community. Mm -hmm. And we need all our volunteers. Go to um, longbeachcommunitytable.com and um, they can sign up, be a volunteer to uh, volunteer packer, volunteer driver, or even just make some donations. There are so many ways that we can be generous with our time and our finances. Please consider serving alongside this amazing organization in this season. And I just want to encourage you all to give generously and joyfully. One of the best things we can do for our own hearts, for the sake of our neighbors and our cities, is to learn how to hold the resources we've been entrusted with, with open hands. So we give our time, energy, and our finances, which we get to practice now. And the ways to give are on the screen. So now, as we enter into worship together, I want to encourage you to just show up. Show up however you are and whoever you are. Jesus isn't looking for anything to be in our hands. He wants them to be open. So let's open our hands and worship him together. Good morning, Garden Church. It's such a joy to get to worship together. We want to invite you to stand up or kneel down, open up your hands, just enter into a posture of worship. We're going to get to sing some songs together this morning. And in a little while, we're going to receive communion together like we do each week. So I want to invite you now. You can gather those elements. And let me just pray for our time as we get started. If you want to close your eyes with me, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Thank you for this space where we get to worship you, God in spirit and in truth. And even though we're scattered and we're not all in the same room, God, I thank you that your spirit unifies us, that the confession that Jesus is Lord unifies us. And so today we worship you, God. We thank you so much for all the ways that you've been faithful. And now we sing worship to you this morning from a place of gratitude and wonder and awe, God, for all the things that you've done and all the things that we know you're going to do. And we bless you now. In your name we pray. Amen. Sun 
Say 
getting saved I will praise your name And great is your faithfulness to me Oh
We're gonna receive communion together now. And I just wanna remind us again of why we take this posture week after week as a, as a whole body, as the body of Christ. And it's because Jesus commands us to. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And there's this old hymn, many of you know, it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. There is something in the human heart which is designed to wander and be distracted. And we know this about ourselves, but the beautiful thing about communion is it's this rock solid thing that we can stand on, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as we take the cracker and it's broken, we're reminded that Christ's body was broken for us. And as we drink the juice, we're reminded that his blood was shed for us so that we could enter into the new covenant with him, which means once and for all, death no longer has the final word. So I'm gonna pray in just a moment, but I also uh, just wanted to read from Hebrews chapter six. This is from the message. It says this, we who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline, reaching past all appearances, right to the very presence of God where Jesus is, running on ahead of us, and he's taken up his permanent post as high priest for us in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is the hope that we have today. So I wanna pray for us. And I was just sensing as we were worshiping, some of you, all you could bring today was I'm here, I'm feeling hopeless, but I'm here. And I feel like God wants to breathe life into you. He wants to speak hope over you. He wants to give you a better word. And I just believe that he's so present with us right now. So we'll sing another song in just a moment, but let me pray for us as we receive communion. God, I thank you that you are, you are here with us right now, that you know no boundaries of TVs or whatever, all the limitations we feel like we have, God, your presence goes out before us. And right now, Lord, I pray that where there has been death, you would bring life. Where there has been hopelessness, God, I pray that you would bring your hope this morning. Where there's been restlessness and anxiety, that you would pour out your peace and the oil of joy today. And we thank you, God, for communion being a reminder that death no longer has the final word, that we have victory in Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen. You can receive communion now. We're gonna continue to worship together.
no claim on me. Then came the morning, and then came the morning that sealed the promise. And your buried body, it began to breathe. And now. you for lifting our heads up, God, for bringing the dead parts of our hearts back to life. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. And thank you for just this moment to worship together, to be in your presence, God. I pray that this wouldn't be a passing feeling, but we would invite your presence into each moment of every day in all the ordinary spaces. And we thank you that you are moving and breathing. And we love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. What a joy to worship with you this morning, Garden Church. Thanks for worshiping with us. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you this morning. We are continuing our series in the rule of life. If you have a Bible, I'm just gonna jump right in. We're gonna check out Genesis 1 and I'm gonna frame this uh, subject today. It says this in chapter one of verse 26 in Genesis. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the living over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Check this out. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Father, I pray right now that you would bless us, that you would allow us to know your word and live in response to who you are and what you're saying. Jesus, may we be um, disciples of you. And I pray that what we are about to talk about would um, take root in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. God says, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature. So humanity is made in the image of God. Humanity, male and female, are made out of God's likeness. We represent him. And this language is enthronement language. It has to do with um, taking on the nature and character. We are representatives of God. And the words he chooses to use as he, in some ways, commissions humanity into its task is first the rule, sub, uh, sorry, the word subdue and rule. The word subdue is kibosh. I love that word, kibosh, in Hebrew. And it means to bring under your influence. And the second word is rule, radah, to exercise authority over, to govern, to have dominion. So in the beginning of time, God empowers and partners with humanity in the careful cultivation and stewardship of creation. Are you with me? Our God gives us a task. Our God-given human task was to work in relationship with God and to extend God's culture, if you will, life of the Garden of Eden to the rest of the planet. And so God invites humanity into relationship with him and gives them purpose. Our task, to partner with him in stewarding creation, to cultivate environments for the rest of creation to flourish, to rule and subdue, is to function out of and within what it means to be image bearers of God. We are to manage creation on behalf of God. Are you with me? Welcome to church, Sunday morning, here we go. Now, this is our task. This is what God desires, his dream for humanity and creation. But this dream gets distorted because of sin. Our relationship with God gets distorted because of sin. Our relationship with ourselves and each other and the rest of creation is destroyed and distorted because of sin. Our choice to rebel against God's way. But through Christ, through Jesus Christ, we now have a restored relationship with God. Can I get an amen? A restored relationship with ourselves, each other, and creation. Obviously, we are working through this as disciples of Jesus. Lord knows I want a perfect, loving relationship with my wife, but my sinful nature keeps acting up. Do you know what I'm talking about? That anger, that temper, that disappointment, that COVID frustration that comes out. So the Lord is working with us as we renew ourselves with him through the power of the Holy Spirit, through grace, through discipline, But our relationship is restored and now we continue in our original mandate to steward creation by partnering with God to renew creation. Now, what is this in the biblical sense? And I I wanna frame this talk today and this rule of life through this lens of God's desire and dream for humanity and his desire for you to partner with him in the restoration and renewal of all things, the word I wanna give you today to frame everything is the word stewardship. Stewardship is the word. You are a steward. This is what I want to be, I want this to be in your imagination as we move forward. Uh, The word steward by the Oxford definition, the Oxford definition says that it's a job of of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. 
to steward is to manage or to look after. Now, I'm going to suggest as followers of Jesus, we now need to put everything we possess, our material possessions, our finances, our houses and apartments, our cars and our bikes and our skateboards, our clothes, our books, our shoes, our food, the things we drink, our savings, our futures, our 401ks, our dreams, our plans, our knowledge, our education, our talent and skills, our spiritual gift, our revelation, our relationships, our body, our emotions, our mind, our words, our actions, our speech, our time, our energy, our privileges, our power, our perspectives, our collective experiences all come under Jesus' lordship when we choose to follow Jesus as disciples. We now steward our lives and all of the facets of our lives based on God's desires and dreams for his kingdom rule to become reality in and through us and around us. Are you with me, church? In other words, as stewards of the grace given to us in Jesus, we live our lives as if our lives belong to him. We manage our life on behalf of him. You are a steward. And you are a steward of your life because your life is a precious resource in the kingdom of God. Your life has been created and redeemed. You have been set apart, saved, sanctified, and empowered to live freely in the kingdom of God here and now. And this is why you must see your life and everything in it as uh, something to steward, as something to manage on behalf of. All of life is to be stewarded. It's not just about money and possessions, but we do need to talk about money and possessions. Because when we talk about developing a rule of life around stewardship, we need to know that we need to carefully reconstruct our lives practically around the way of Jesus. It's not just with our spiritual lives, our prayer, our worship, not just with community and the things we serve and give away, but actually the tangible things. The question is, how might Jesus want you, how might Jesus want me to use the things in my life to extend God's kingdom around me? In order to learn about the important things, the big things, the spiritual things, we must first learn to handle and manage and steward the little things like money and possessions, and our stuff. In Matthew 6, Jesus identifies the greatest threat to our discipleship is putting our trust in money, wealth, and possessions. He says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, verse 24. Now, we could look at the story in Luke chapter 19 of the rich young ruler, and we might think that our task as disciples is simply to give all of our money away, that money is evil, it's bad, and so our task is to live in poverty and give it all away. And now, I would like to suggest that um, that's not what the Bible teaches, and there are many movements throughout history that would have taught, taught that, but the, the real uh, we, we might assume that real faith is stepping into poverty, but one only really needs to look at that scripture to realize that the story is, is less about giving all your money away and more about where your heart and your trust and faith lie. You see, you can be poor and have your faith and your trust in wealth and money. And you can be very, very rich in regards to the things of the world and yet your faith and trust cannot be in the money, but it can be in God. You see, it's not simply about giving your money away. Let me be clear. Whoever cannot have, whoever cannot have riches without worshiping them, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Whoever cannot have riches without worshiping them above God should get rid of them. <laughs> if the things that you possess get in the way of your full devotion to God and that's where you put your trust, then yes, get rid of those things. And there are seasons where maybe you need to get rid of, of those things, but... The point is trust and service. Poverty in itself is, is not recommended by God in the scriptures, and it's not in itself a means of grace, which is why Dallas Willard clears this up in his Spirit of 
um, the disciplines. He writes, should we not be like the birds of the air, which sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns? Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. That seems to be the true life of faith. If that's true, though, how could we fail to include poverty in our list of the central disciplines for the spiritual life? There is a very good reason why not. The idealization of poverty is one of the most dangerous illusions of Christians in the contemporary world. Stewardship, which requires possessions and including, includes giving, is the true spiritual discipline in relation to wealth. In other words, it, if, you, if you see money as evil and your job is to live in poverty, then you are confused because what Dallas Willard talks about is that as followers of Jesus, we need to understand that in order to really possess something or in order to really give something away in regards to the things of this world, we must learn the spiritual discipline of stewardship because stewardship is required for us to engage in ordinary life the way Jesus would have us. And let me be clear as I talk about this. If you have a refrigerator or electricity, if you have a car, if you have food in the fridge, I want to suggest, according to the statistics of of the world, you are at least in the top 5% of the wealthiest people on the planet. So I'm assuming if you're listening to this on a TV or a device on YouTube, you are in the top 1%, 99% of those today who are the wealthiest in the world. So your task uniquely is to learn to steward your resources and your life on behalf of God. Are you with me? How you steward your income and your money and your possessions and your stuff today has eternal consequences. When we steward what we have with kingdom values, God will increase our capacity to handle what Jesus calls true wealth and riches. If we are faithful with our income, he will increase our influence, not just in this life, but in the age to come. Now, this may sound like some type of empty promise, but check this out. Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, Who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And then it goes on, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus says, if you can be trusted with those very little things, and what is he referring to? He's referring to money. If you can be trusted with very little things, the money, then you will be trusted with true riches. And he's referring to other things. If you have been trustworthy with your income, your stuff, and your money, the very little things in life, the very little kind of things in life, then God will entrust you to steward True riches. And I love the way the King James puts it. He says this in the King James Version. He says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Are you faithful with the least kinds of things in your life? You know, like your bank account, like your home, like the cars, like the, the, the closets full of stuff like the 401k, like your, your priorities of the way you spend your time, energy, money on earth. How are you doing, church? Just let that settle in for a little bit. Here's a quote from Upside Down Kingdom. It says this, in Hebrew, steward means manager over the house. The steward is an official who controls a large household for the master. It's certainly fitting for Christians to use the term stewardship to describe our relationship to property because the concept reminds us that God, in fact, owns the property. But what do we mean by stewardship? It's helpful to distinguish between the wishes of the owner and the wishes of the steward. The steward is responsible to manage the property according 
to the master's wishes, not the steward's. We sometimes use the term stewardship to whitewash our own desires. We may, for example, say stewardship means taking whatever resources we have, multiplying them as fast as possible, and using them for our own purposes. Oh, come on. <laughs> In other words, stewardship is not just an, not an excuse to use your money to make more money for yourself. Yes, I believe in investment. Yes, I believe in being creative with the money that you make so that can make more money. But biblical stewardship is treating all of your stuff as though you don't own it. You are simply the manager that has access to it. And oftentimes I hear Christians talk about stewardship in challenging generosity and it simply is a way of empowering selfish living. Rather than empowering the kingdom life, a steward is someone, we we choose to, to empower our own life, but a steward is someone who manages resources on behalf of the owner. You are not the owner, you are the manager. So when we talk about a rule of life, we're learning how to manage our life on behalf of God. All of the resources we have access to, all of the things in our life, the stuff, the physical resources, the relational resources, the the mental, emotional capital that we possess, are we choosing to intentionally order or reorder our lives around Jesus. So a steward is in the kingdom is one who cares and cultivates their whole life, including their resources and possessions on behalf of God's desires, values, and dreams and purposes. You see, stewardship leads to true riches and learning to give away what we possess is the key to learning how to care for the things that we have. You see, generosity is how our world will increase, but we don't know how to live fully into generosity until we are good stewards. This is why I talked about it last week. I said that the part of generosity is tied to stewardship because we can't live generously without first learning to be a steward because we don't know all of the stuff that we have to carry and give away with Jesus. So as you talk about your resources, the questions that my wife and I regularly ask are things like, do or does my budget, my spending, my savings, my debt, my giving, my desires, do they reflect God's heart for the world around me? See, stewardship begins with the things that you possess, the things that you have access to, your finances, your physical resources and possessions, but it's also deeper than that. You see, we're not just called to steward the the things that we own or things that we can buy, the things that we can give, give and sell. We're also called, according to scripture, to steward our bodies and our minds in our emotions, and this is why we talk about soul care, but when, when you get into the scriptures, you see that our bodies are, par- are, are part of the key areas of our lives that we are called to steward, which I feel like we neglect in the church. Romans chapter six, it says this in verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. So Paul in Romans talks about sin not reigning or having rule in our moral physical bodies. We're not called to obey the evil desires but instead we offer ourselves to God. We offer every part of our physical body to God as an instrument of righteousness. We dedicate our physical bodies as an instrument to be used for righteousness on behalf of God. Isn't that interesting? First Corinthians 
chapter 6. Let's just keep going, shall we? Verse 18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Come on, church. Paul makes one of the most profound statements that we overlook over and over again because we have this Christianese language. Your body is a temple. This is a significant statement because the Jews worshiped God in the temple and the temple was the space where heaven and earth existed together. It's the coexistence of eternity in a physical space. It's where the spirit of God dwelled and his presence rests and Paul is saying that the most important central image to Uh, to the Jews and to the most important significant image on earth, the temple is now you, your body. Your body is where heaven and earth meet. It represents God's desire and design to live and dwell with humanity. A temple represents God's presence in the world. It's the ultimate place of holiness. And Paul is now saying your body is that place. It's where heaven and earth coexist. It's where you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a mini mobile temple. The purpose of the temple was to be a witness, to bear witness to the world. This is significant. Are you with me? I can't preach loud enough here. I can't hear you. Can I get an amen? This, brothers and sisters, whew, can't wait to preach in real live gatherings. I want to hear those amens and hallelujahs loud. I don't want you to hold back. But this is why we need to take care of our physical lives because you are a temple. Your body is a temple of the living God. So yes, of course, why are you indulging in the sinful nature and the flesh, the evil practices? Of course we don't do that. But it's not just that. We need to learn to take care of our physical health. We need to exercise. We need to eat well. We need to give up some of those sodas for a bit because it matters. Your body matters because it's part of God's beautiful, good creation. And yes, some of us have physical limitations and we are waiting to be redeemed once and for all. And that will come. You will experience wholeness in this age or in the age to come because we live in the now and not yet reality. But right now we are still called with whatever capacity we have to steward our lives on behalf of God because we are stewards. Can I get and amen. So Garden Church, I want you to live intentionally, to follow Jesus with your whole life, your whole soul, your relational, your physical, your emotional, your mental and spiritual capital. Let us live well so that we might inherit and receive the things that last for eternity. So you are a steward. We are called to steward. We are called to partner with God in the careful um, cultivation of environments for the rest of creation to flourish. We are called to steward our bodies, our mind, our energies, our time, our possessions, our dreams, our skills, our spiritual gifts. All of those are to be put under Jesus' lordship and direction and be used wherever we are on his behalf. So take this seriously. Now, How do we develop then a rule around stewardship? How do we develop a rule for a well-ordered life? Remember rules, this isn't about following religious programs. This is about uh, strategies for Christ-likeness. This is about going to the gym and getting healthy. Not because you wanna get really good at push-ups, because you wanna get healthy in Christ-likeness. So we take on, we, we, we take off old practices and we put on intentional spiritual practices. We take off unintentional habits to step into intentional disciplines. Um, it's, it's like, uh, it, it's recognizing that the small things have massive impact. The micro disciplines have macro impact. Like when I take emails off my phone or when I put limitations on what I can see on my phone or when I put my phone away when I'm hanging out with my kids, the macro impact is my presence and my availability to the people around me and my lack of distraction as I'm getting on a phone. I'm no longer distracted by those things. So here are some practices I want to give you. I'm just going to list a bunch of things that I've practiced in my life that might be helpful. Again, I want to remind you, we have um, a, a 
uh, a radical discipleship and formation course online. And every single week, digital communities and house churches are, are, are going through these w- with, with their groups. And so I wanna encourage you to go online and fill it out. It's an incredible resource. But here are some practices that will help you. First of all, practices for stewarding your resources, your financial resources. Number one, take an inventory of your resources. Know where your money goes. Where do you spend your finances? Let God uh, uh, audit your bank accounts and your spending habits and allow, ask him into those things. The question you should ask is, does my budget reflect the kingdom of God? Do, does my spending reflect my values as a disciple? Under finances, uh, uh, practice, make a plan to get financially in order, get your finances in order. Number one, go to Financial Peace University online. Do the course. Um, number two, the most important thing we should do as, a, as disciples is live on a budget. Because if we live below our means, it can empower us to give generously, to get out of debt, and to save for the future. I think everyone should be um, have no unnecessary debt. And obviously, that depends on your circumstances. But we must train ourselves to get out of debt, to save for future events, but also to save for emergencies and things that we desire, but also to give. So uh, these are all practices that we can do. We can live on a budget. We can practice snowballing debt. We can save and we can learn to give. Uh, One thing that we love to do is bring our financial decisions to groups of people that we trust. So I encourage you to bring your finances to a small group of people that you will know will hold you accountable and allow them into the decision-making when it comes to buying things, when it comes to big decisions financially. We already talked about this last week, but one of the things you can do with your finances is to practice giving, practice tithing, practice increasing your, the, the percentage of giving that you have and move towards generosity. Lastly, one practice I want to encourage you is to practice intentional consuming. What would it look like for you to go for a month without spending outside the essentials? Just learn what you bring in and and live very intentionally for a month so that it will empower you to give more money away. Just to see what it's like. Do you need to buy that second or third coffee at the coffee shop? Do you have to eat out as much as you eat out? Learn to take inventory of your finances and resources so you know what you have so you can give it away. Now, we move from finances to practices for stewarding your stuff, your possessions. Most people don't like doing this because your stuff is connected to your heart. But take an inventory. Go through and look at all of your stuff. Go into the garage. Pull out the closets. Pull out the kids' toys. And ask the question, do you need everything you have? Why have you stored up so much stuff? One of the biggest Um, fastest growing businesses in the U.S. is storage across the United States. We need more space to store stuff we don't need. Stop storing up stuff you don't need. need. Give it away. Share it with other people. Practice sharing. Ask the question, how might these things that I've collected be used on behalf of Jesus? How might these things extend? Are there things that are dear to you that you won't share? Why? Ask these questions. These questions are less about your stuff and more about your heart. So take an inventory. Practice simplicity or minimalism. I think this is so important. One of the disciplines that we're doing right now, my wife and I, or uh, and some of my friends, is we're doing 40 days of giving um, things away. And it's every day we give one thing away. As a discipline, it could be time, it could be a book, it could be some clothes. We're choosing to live simply in order to uh, value the things of the kingdom. Practice stewarding your time. One of the things our staff does regularly at the Garden Church is we do a 15 minute time audit where we keep track every 15 minutes of everything we do during the work week and beyond. Because we believe time is a resource we don't get back and we want to steward it on behalf of God. We're not doing it for rules. We're doing it for awareness. Where is our time going? Wouldn't you like to know that you're spending so much time on social media or YouTube conspiracy theories or whatever it is you're investing in? Where does your time go? Take an inventory so that you know and you can adjust. Lastly, I want to give you some practices for stewarding your body, and we'll close, close with these. I'm just going to list these things. One, you need to learn to dedicate your body to the Lord. This is coming from Romans chapter 6. Accept your body. It's not yours. Accept it as it is, and no longer idolize your body. 
Choose to no longer misuse your body and submit your body as an instrument of righteousness. I wanna encourage some of you in, the, in regards to stewardship to practice moderation, whether that be with alcohol or sugar or f- food or whatever it is, learn moderation. A discipline that will help you learn stewardship is to sleep more, to eat healthy, to exercise, to practice Sabbath, and to practice fasting. These are all things that will empower stewardship. Now, there's a lot of practices, and they will all be on the website for resources. They're in the coursework, so you can learn these practices based on what you need now. You might need to focus on your finances. Some of you might need to focus on the fact that you have a closet full of stuff you don't need. Some of you might want to practice stewarding your time, realizing you're wasting all sorts of time on social media, on your phone, on emails at home. All of these things are are ways to become evaluate the resources of your life so that you can grow in Christ likeness. It's not to be religious about these things. It's to, it's about being free from them so that you're useful in the kingdom of God. We want to be stewards of every resource that God gives us because that's what it means to follow Jesus as a disciple. We put everything at his feet and we say, have your way, Jesus. Let us follow you and know you fully. So with that, um, I pray that you become a steward and partner with God in the careful renewal and cultivation of creation, that you would be, uh, that you would take on the human task of renewing all things with Jesus in partnership with him.